Hot for day, good evening, and thanks for tuning in to PNC's News First. We're live from the Broadcast Center of Conta. I'm Clint Rogel. And I'm Janella Carrera. Thanks for joining us. Topping your news first tonight, at least one health insurance agency has already threatened to cut off coverage to Guam retirees this month. NetCare Insurance sent a notice to its affected members and to the Department of Administration warning that coverage for retirees will be suspended effective March 21st. The notice of suspension was sent last Thursday to DOA, which indicates that DOA has not remitted payment to NetCare for the retiree health insurance premiums since October of last year. Therefore, the letter states, quote, the retiree's health insurance coverage shall be suspended effective March 21st. A similar notice was sent to GovGuam retirees subscribed to NetCare, and so far, NetCare isn't the only one who hasn't been paid by GovGuam. Calvo Select Care says GovGuam's account is also in arrears. Plan Administrator Frank Campillo tells PNC that Select Care is owed about $12 million. Of that amount, the largest categories are retirees and the Guam Memorial Hospital. He says for retirees, GovGuam is eight pay periods behind, while GMH is seven pay periods behind. The Foster Children Program is five months behind. Campillo says they've already put DOA on notice and will probably send another demand letter this week. However, he also says that they are committed to working with DOA to ensure that there is no disruption in the market. Calls to take care insurance were not returned as of news time. The governor's office announced the need for more cuts while lawmakers continue to discuss a sales tax bill. According to the administration, because there is no solution yet to the fiscal crisis from senators, more cuts will be made to things like swimming pools and recreational facilities. Adaloop says its senior staff members will begin 32-hour work weeks this week. The governor's office says, quote, Without the ability to furlough expeditiously, the governor must make cuts to services rather than personnel. Beginning this Saturday, March 17th, GovGuam will close down both the Higatnya and Dedido pools, the Department of Parks and Recreation sports facilities like the Tizen Ball Fields, Dedido Sports Complex, Adaloop Field, Paseo Stadium, and Guerrero Field will be closed in the evenings. And public parks managed by DPR will shut off lights in the evenings as well. The administration is also looking at terminating leases for the Department of Chamorro Affairs, the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities, and the Guam Museum. The governor's office says that in the coming week, they might begin disconnecting street lights and suspending private school busing. Lawmakers continue deliberating over Bill 248, which would create a 2% sales tax. This morning, most of the discussions centered around Senator Frank Ogan Jr.'s government reorganization amendment, which is essentially his bill that would reorganize the government of Guam. Here's more. We are reestablishing a provision that would empower or provide the authority which already the governor of Guam presently has in the Organic Act. But because of these laws that, that assert constrain any extensive reorganization of the government of Guam, what this would provide is that opportunity and that authority for the governor of Guam through this amendment should it pass recognizing that education, public safety, and health care are priorities and that we need to look at streamlining. And Senator Frank Ogan Jr. said his reorganization amendment to Senator Joe St. Augustine's sales tax bill would cut the red tape that hinders the governor's ability to reorganize and streamline the government. The red tape that we're trying to eliminate, um, might one interpret that as protections for the employees that would be impacted by reorganization? There's uh, existing provisions that have not been uh, extracted or deleted, or the proposal is not to delete those particular provisions, and one of them is the Public Employees Management Relations Act, because our permanent employees certainly have to be given due process in regards to uh, any action by the governor of Guam as it applies to their permanent employment. Senator Ogan said his amendment would not remove these protections. Lawmakers spent most of the morning discussing different sections of Senator Ogan's reorganization amendment. We want to encourage us to move forward and let's have the discussion on the sales tax or the BPT or something that can get us that much closer to figuring out this cash crisis. This really comes down 
to prioritizing funding. And if we're going to entertain a funding legislation without a corresponding reduction in expenses of this government, without giving the governor of Guam the flexibility to be able to reorganize this government so that we can realize some savings and some cost reduction for the balance of this fiscal year and moving forward, then that's not a balanced approach. Ultimately, Ugin's reorganization amendment was adopted and added to the sales tax bill. Shortly before news time, Senators Frank Ogan Jr. and Mike Sinicholas were pushing amendments to adopt the governor's fiscal realignment plan. As of news time, senators were still discussing this amendment. The Department of Education says if it doesn't get an influx of cash soon, they will put phase two of their cost-cutting measures into place. And as PNC's Melissa Leon Guerrero reports, the latest round of cuts will affect the classroom. Education Department Superintendent John Fernandez and Board Chairman Mark Mendiola met with student leaders and their parents this afternoon to bring them into the loop on how the latest round will hit the classrooms. And tomorrow night, the board will be meeting to pour over and vote on the proposed budget cuts. Included in what's being called Phase 2 are the postponing of purchasing special education buses, reducing contracts by an additional 5%, reducing on-call substitutes, freezing all salary increments and extending a hiring freeze to all vacancies throughout the department. This would result in a cost savings to DOE of $2.8 million. Superintendent John Fernandez says although their goal has been to mitigate any impact on the classrooms, with what they're putting on the table in this latest round of cuts, the students will feel it. So, you know, the biggest impact of phase two is really um, the fact that we are um, both freezing hiring throughout the department, especially at the school level. So if there are teacher positions coming up, or if there are school aid, you know, school staff positions, uh, central st you know, central office staff will continue to be frozen, and then reducing the reliance on on-call substitutes uh, when there's a teacher absence. Um, you know, those two uh, items that you know would save about 1.5 million dollars. Just just those two items alone. Fernandez says this means the schools will have to bear the burden of covering for absent teachers. And although the board will hear the cost-cutting plan at their meeting tomorrow night, they still hope senators will vote favorably on a bill that would sift monies to the department before March 19th, which is when Phase Two is earmarked to take place. Fernandez says the passage of such a bill, if signed into law, would just put off the inevitable. You know, right? I mean, I, I think that it would at least forestall any immediate implementation of some of these reductions. I mean, some of these things we're obviously looking at anyways in terms of you know, the longer term uh, realignment of the department, you know, given the fact that these this, the Trump uh, tax cuts are going to be for, with us for 10 years. But it'll immediately forestall having to do it just because there's a, you know, a budget situation at hand or a cash situation at hand. So. Phase three of the proposal would include delaying the start of school until October 1st, close school facilities after hours and have limited summer hours, and apply a 32-hour work week beginning July 1st to September 30th. In the meantime, Fernandez says he doesn't see the board or department implementing these cuts as early as March 19th if relief comes before then in the form of legislation. For PNC News, I'm Melissa Leon Guerrero. And tomorrow's Education Board meeting takes place at 6 o'clock at JFK High School. That meeting is open to the public. Meanwhile, the most sweeping tax overhaul in decades is being blamed for an ocean of expected red ink in GovGuam coffers this year. But one island expert says there may just be a silver lining. PNC's Washington correspondent Matt Kay reports. Even as Governor Eddie Calvo in the Guam legislature struggled to find ways to halt a flood of red ink from lower individual and business tax rates, GOP policymakers in Washington and nonpartisan studies cite offsetting benefits. Longtime GOP island consultant and former interior official Fred Radawagon. Well, I'm certainly sympathetic to the government of Guam because they're not masters of their own fate because of their ties to the federal tax system, but I don't believe it's all negative uh, because of the uh, the tax cuts. Referring to a new study by the Nonpartisan Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy, Radawagon says Guam businesses and households will have more to spend. There's going to be uh, increased spending because of higher disposable incomes. 
both uh, in Guam and on the mainland. Uh, demand will be felt across a wide range of businesses serving both local residents and tourists. And after tax profits may well lead to higher pay for some workers. Resulting in more business investment, more sales, and more taxes paid to Gov Guam as tax rates fall, but exemptions for sales tax and mortgage interest are capped. Add to that, Radawagon says, the military buildup and down the road, the realignment of thousands of Marines to Guam, and that means even more local spending, more jobs, and more tax revenue for Guam. Matt Kay for PNC News on Capitol Hill. Well, medical examiner Dr. Aurelio Espinola says the body discovered last Thursday in an abandoned car had been there for about a week before it was found. He ruled the death an accident. Dr. Espinola identified the victim as 38-year-old Lodge Otesis and says he died of suffocation, noting that all the windows had been rolled up in the car. Guam Police Spokesman Sergeant Paul Tapao says the body was discovered around 2 p.m. last Thursday by the owner of the Hyundai Santa Fe, who had parked the car along Pencaso Paulton Lane in Timuting to put it up for sale. It's not clear if police are suspecting foul play at this point. And Dr. Espinola could not say whether Otesis had alcohol in his system at the time of his death. Meanwhile, in a separate case, Dr. Espinola says he's still waiting for the test results of another autopsy involving a woman whose body was found in a river in Agate. Dr. Espinola says the woman's body was in the river for a few days before it was discovered, but at this point it's unclear if the woman drowned or if her body was dumped into the river. Dr. Espinola sent slides to a lab, the results of which will help determine how the woman died. Senator Dennis Rodriguez Jr. officially launched his gubernatorial campaign while also announcing his running mate, David M. Cruz. During a campaign kickoff ceremony over the weekend, Cruz is an educator who took a demotion in order to run for office while still keeping his job. David M. Cruz is an educator and retired Air Force colonel who currently leads the Air Force J. Rotsi program at JFK High School. Troy Torres, staffer for Senator Rodriguez, says Colonel Cruz took a demotion from his job to be able to run for office, going from a classified to an unclassified position under a personnel services contract. In other words, he took a voluntary demotion to be able to run for office, something that hasn't been done before. Guam Department of Education Superintendent John Fernandez confirmed on News Talk K57 this morning that although Colonel Cruz is so far the only instructor who's converted from a classified to an unclassified position, moving forward, all instructors will be hired under contract. Fernandez added that half the salaries for the JROTC instructors are reimbursed by the Department of Defense. Staffing patterns for GDOE show that in the third quarter of fiscal year 2017, Cruz was making a salary of $197,263 for base and $259,660 with benefits. Then in the fourth quarter of FY17, his salary was listed at $120,445 base and $166,841 with benefits. Torres on News Talk K57 with host Patty Arroyo revealed that Cruz was threatened by a high-level person not to run for lieutenant governor and that they are now planning to file a complaint with the Guam Election Commission under the Mini Hatch Act. Torres also addressed any concerns about the legality of Cruz's employment. We have to look at the law very carefully and see what the exemptions were. And the Mini Hatch Law says, you know, a person who has a, who's contracted with the government of Guam for a fee. That's and you know that, that that whole thing was vetted by um, Department of Education's attorneys and by the Attorney General's office and everything because the reason this was such a big deal um, was uh, you know Dave Cruz um, basically getting harassed by a high-level uh, person um, in order to get him not to run and and another part of the mini hatch law makes it a felony to use your government position to try to convince somebody to run or not run for public right. office. Right, absolutely. So that's probably a complaint that we're going to be registering with the Guam Election Commission very soon. Meanwhile, at their campaign kickoff ceremony on Saturday, Rodriguez said he chose Cruz as his running mate because he wanted someone who was not jaded by politics. He also said that although he's been in office for the last eight years, his journey is just getting started. It was a long journey to just get up to this point, and we're just starting. Today is just the start of our journey to ensure that we keep our island that special place that it is. 
The Democrat team of Rodriguez Cruz is now the fourth Democratic team vying for Adeloupe. The other three are the gubernatorial teams of Leon Guerrero Tenorio, Ugin Limtiaco, and Gutierrez Bordalia. There's only one set of candidates on the Republican ticket so far Lieutenant Governor Ray Tenorio and Tony Ada. Police have arrested a man who is accused of molesting tourists while they were swimming at the Fisheye Marine Park in Petey. According to police, six women reported that a man wearing yellow shorts touched them inappropriately. Only two of the women who reported the alleged pervert to the fisheye manager stayed behind to be interviewed by police. One of the victims was a 57-year-old woman who says the man, now identified as Myung Siap Lee, squeezed her buttocks. The second victim, a 34-year-old woman, reported that Lee put his hands between her legs and touched her genital area. Police say Lee denied touching the women and said he was at the park with his family. Lee was charged with two counts of fourth degree criminal sexual conduct as a misdemeanor. All right, well, it's time for weather. Let's check in now with Joycelyn Atlick.